Hey, what's going on everyone? I'm super excited to bring you this video today. I finally have the Ambonic RG552 and we can finally start testing out the device. Now the RG552 is of course Ambonic's latest retro handheld. It's a dual boot system, meaning that you've got Android and Linux. On the Android side of things, you'll be able to load up the Google Play Store and run all of those apps on that store. So you'll be able to do emulators and run Android games. On the Linux side, you've got the emulators as well, but you've also got the custom firmware developed by the community. And I think that's gonna be really exciting. Now, in this video, we're just gonna focus in on the Android side of things because there's so much to cover and we might come back at a later date to do custom firmware on Linux. So full disclosure, I have two RG552 handhelds, a black one which I purchased when it went on sale and a gray review unit sent to me by Ambonic and I wanna thank them for sending it to me. Now, I also want to add that Ambonic is not a part of the testing or creation of these videos and they won't see the videos until they go live and all of these opinions are my own. Now, given I have two of these handhelds, it would be a bit of a waste if I were to keep both of them. So I'd like to give the gray unit away to a lucky viewer and I'll have the details of the competition at the end of this video. Okay, if you like this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this, and we have a Discord server, so come along and join us there, and I'll leave a link in the description below. Okay, so just a quick word on the content I'm gonna make. There's gonna be a series of videos on the RG552 because there's just so much content to cover. In this video, we're gonna be doing an unboxing and then we're gonna look at the design and build quality of the handheld. And then we're gonna set up the handheld. And then finally, we're gonna play some 8-bit, 16-bit and PlayStation 1 games. And then in future videos, we're gonna be doing PSP, Dreamcast, Saturn, Nintendo 64 and GameCube. So make sure you're subscribed to get all of those videos and then finally we're going to have a final thoughts and review video at the end of the process. It's time to do the unboxing. Inside you'll find the unit sitting on top which I'll put aside for just a second. I ordered the UK charger and it comes with an adapter over the US style plug so if you want both plugs get the UK version. The power adapter is a universal charger meaning it does between 100 volts to 240 volts the maximum charge it provides is 20 volts at 1.5 amps giving 30 watts. Under the tray you'll find a screen protector which I have already gone ahead and applied it. There's also a set of instructions here. There's a USB-C to USB-C cable and some micro SD cards. On the 16GB card you'll have the Linux operating system and the 64GB card will have a bunch of games and ROMs if you have ordered that. Android is installed on the internal storage of the handheld. Here's the handheld and overall it's a very nice looking device. Before we look at the build quality, let's take a look at the specs, benchmarks and talk about the price first. This is a Rockchip 3399 hexacore which is a dual core A72 at 1.8 GHz and four A53 cores at 1.4 GHz. The GPU is a Mali T860, there's 4 GB of LPDDR4 RAM there's 64 gigabytes of eMMC 5.1 storage and you have the Android operating system installed on this. There's a 5.36 inch 1920 by 1152 IPS LCD touchscreen and it's a really good panel as I'll show you later in this video. Inside there's two batteries combined to give 6400 milliamp hours battery life. For wireless connectivity, there's only 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, so no 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi and there's also no Bluetooth. Wi-Fi 5 GHz would have given much faster speeds and would have made this a more capable streaming machine. If I have time, I will try out the streaming capabilities in a later video. The Bluetooth is an interesting omission because that would have easily allowed for external controllers. It's possible to connect a Bluetooth USB adapter, but it would have been much better if this was included internally. Here are the Geekbench scores for both the CPU single core and multi core performance, and I'll also leave a link to the Geekbench score so you can compare it to other devices. Right now, at the time of recording, the RG552 is priced at $226 on Ambonic's official website. I know some people think it's a little high, and I think it's important to mention it now so you can consider this while watching the video. Obviously, value is a very subjective thing, so I'm going to try and provide you with as much information and video as possible so you can make your own decision on this handheld. Moving on, let's take a look at the unit itself. As you can see, this design is very much like the Ambonic RG351P, which is one of my favorite handhelds. So I guess if it's not broken, don't fix it. 
On the front, you'll find D-pad and face buttons in line with each other and analog sticks underneath them. Both analog sticks can be pushed in for L3 and R3 buttons. Up above the D-pad and face buttons, there's also select and start buttons. The D-pad is very similar to the Ambinic RG351P, so if you've played with that, you can expect pretty much the same thing. It's a very responsive D-pad and feels really great. Similarly, the face buttons feel really good as well. Both the D-pad and buttons are set high enough so your thumbs don't hit the shell. On top, there are L1, L2 and R1 and R2 buttons. These are all in line with each other and I've been okay with this in the past, but given every handheld is different, I'll need to see if this affects playing comforts. In terms of ports and other buttons, there is a USB-C port for charging, a USB-C port for data, a 3.5mm headphone jack and a mini HDMI display out. On the left hand side there are volume buttons and on the right hand side there is a power button. Below the screen there's a TF card slot which you can use for a Linux operating system, a reset button, a home or function button and a second TF card slot which you can use to store games and files. In terms of dimensions it's 198.1mm by 85mm by 20mm. Comparatively it's kind of in that middle ground between big and small devices. Here I've got the Switch Lite RG351P and a PowerKitty X18S for comparison. As you can see, it's similar to the Switch Lite, they both have similar size screens, but the RG552 feels a little chunkier in the hand and I think some people might like that. The interesting thing is that the RG552 is heavier than all of these devices. The RG552 weighs in at 355 grams, while the next heaviest is the PowerKitty X18S at 310 grams. The Switch Lite, which has a similar form factor, weighs in at 277 grams and feels slimmer and lighter to hold. In comparison, the RG552 feels a bit bulkier and heavier in comparison, but we'll have to see how this holds up in long play sessions. As I've said before on my channel, I prefer plastic devices over metal ones mostly because they're lighter. And here Ambinic have kind of given us the best of both worlds. The shell is finished with a metallic paint so that it somewhat mimics the look of Ambinic's metal handhelds. It looks really great and feels really premium. On other handhelds, they can come with a very cheap feeling plastic. But here the shell reminds me of the finish on some higher end laptops. While I boot up Android here, just a quick word on the charging, the battery was completely flat when I got it and it took about an hour to charge to 80%, but after that it charged quite slowly, taking another hour to reach 93%. After using it a little bit, I charged it for another 5 hours this morning, but it wouldn't charge more than 94%, so there might be something wrong with my unit here. I'll do more testing and report back on battery life in a later video. Before we get into some retro gaming on Android, I want to talk about one of the things that immediately struck me about this handheld, and that is the beautiful high quality LCD panel. I don't have any special equipment to measure screen accuracy or color range, so the best I can do is compare it to another handheld, so I've chosen the Switch Lite, which has a really nice LCD panel as well. In general, the panel is really good, though I do notice the screen has a slightly more red tint to it that you can see in some of these screenshots. This Animal Crossing screenshot definitely looks like it's more red on the RG552. In practice though, it's pretty hard to tell as you can see in this video comparison. So I won't be talking too much about the out of the box experience as I think most people will want to update it straight away as the latest update includes Google Play Store. I did have a quick play around with the system as it came and ATV Launcher is the front end menu system here and Ambinic have included some emulators so you can definitely use it like this if you wanted to. Now to update your firmware and add the Google Play Store, I'll leave links to the official Ambinic YouTube video guide and that way there's no confusion in the firmware update process. In short, it's very easy to do, just download the program and the Android update image, use the program to write the Android update to a micro SD card, and then insert that micro SD card into the TF1 slot and let the program install the update. Let's talk about RetroArch now, if you haven't used RetroArch, I'll give some brief instructions here. The first thing you want to do is copy over your ROM files to the handheld and to do that plug in a USB-C cable to the handheld and to your PC. Next go to your handheld and drag the drop down menu from the top and go to the developer options menu. In here change the USB configuration option from charging to MTP or media transfer protocol. 
That'll let you find the handheld in Windows Explorer. I haven't tried it on Mac, but it should be similar. From here, create a directory that you'll remember and put all your ROM files there. Back on the handheld in RetroArch, if it's your first time loading it up, just wait until it unpacks all the data. After that, I like to change the user interface to XMB, which I'm more familiar with. Make sure you save current configuration and then quit out of RetroArch and then the user interface will update. Now to actually play your ROMs, first you want to download an emulator core. For SNES, I'll go ahead and use SNES 9X. Next, you want to scroll across and scan directory and locate the directory where you added all your SNES games from before and let it scan. It'll add them all to a SNES library. One final thing you want to do is go to settings, video, scaling and turn on integer scaling. That'll give you the right aspect ratio for each system and leave black bars around the sides. It works pretty well for Genesis, SNES, NES, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. Although something like PlayStation leaves rather large black bars top and bottom so you may want to stretch that one out. Alright finally let's move on to some game testing and a reminder I'll put up the full videos on my second channel Jim RPG 2 so go and check that out and I'll leave a link in the description. Let's start with Game Boy and I always like to show off Game Boy because I like to mess around with the Game Boy colorization. This is pretty easy to change, start the game and then go into options, turn GB colorization to internal and then select an internal palette. Here's Game Boy with the original green and black screen and here is the Game Boy Pocket look. Here I'm using the SGB4A option which gives a brown colored palette. Here's R-Type, it's probably not the best version of R-Type but I wanted to try out the dark blue colorization. It looks okay but I'm sure there's probably a better color palette out there. I think Super Mario Land looks great here with the SGB1B color palette, it gives Mario a great red and brown costume. I remember beating this game a lot as a kid but it never looked as good as this. The Game Boy screen would often be very faded especially as batteries drained. Here you hardly have to worry about batteries and this is easily the best I've seen Super Mario Land look. I got a lot of feels playing this game knowing I played the original 30 years ago. Here's Fire Emblem on Game Boy Advance. GBA games look really good here, I've been playing them on the RG351P which is a 3.5 inch screen and playing them on the RG552 feels a little oversized however I got quickly used to it. If you haven't played GBA games in a while I think you'll be surprised that many games hold up really well. One game that holds up great is Castlevania Circle of the Moon. I'm about halfway through on this on the RG351P. I didn't have many GBA games growing up but I did save up to buy this full price because I just thought this was the coolest game ever. That said playing this on an original GBA was a struggle as it was really dark and on these modern retro handhelds this has never been a problem. GBA has a ton of role playing games including Final Fantasy 1, 2, 4, 5 and 6. Here's Final Fantasy 4. The game has this old school RPG maker style combat gameplay but there's a ton of production value in the story, gameplay, music and sound that really makes this game hold up well. Moving on to Super Nintendo, Super Street Fighter 2 is such a beautiful looking game with bright colors and an improved art style from the earlier Street Fighter games. It also gives us a chance to test out the D-pad in terms of fireballs and dragon punches. The D-pad does feel a little bit stiff so it could be one where your thumbs need a bit more practice and training up. Super Metroid is a game that had significant slowdown on my lower powered PAL Kitty V90 so I was interested to test this out. It runs flawlessly here and the game still plays really well to this day.
I didn't expect any problems with Mega Drive, Genesis games, and Streets of Rage 2 looks really good here and runs great. There's also an emulator called Genesis Plus GX Wide, which allows you to play Genesis games in widescreen mode, though there are some issues here and there. Sonic 2 really shows off how good the screen can be with its bright color palette. I think the 5.3 inch screen size is really amazing for SNES and Genesis games. This is Art of Fighting on Neo Geo and I'm using a Neo Emu standalone emulator here and it's a little limited in terms of options but it's fine to show off performance of the game. Art of Fighting runs with no problems. King of Fighters 2003 plays really fast and fluid and unfortunately I can't say the same about my gameplay here but you can see that the performance is really good and works well. With PlayStation 1 games, I was a little disappointed with the overall performance, though I don't think it's the hardware itself. Here's Gran Turismo 2, and it seems locked at 30 FPS, and I don't know if there's any way to increase the frame rate. Aside from that, it's a very smooth 30 and definitely playable. I tried this on RetroArch, PC, SX, Rearmed, and Standalone Duck Station. Performance for Tony Hawk 2 seems a bit all over the place. On the one hand, RetroArch PCSX Rearmed has significant slowdown throughout, but RetroArch Duck Station has much improved performance. However, the standalone Duck Station has the worst performance, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. Fight. Tekken 3 is one game that runs great, and this runs at 60 FPS. One reason I don't think it's a hardware issue is because it can play much more demanding games like PSP and Dreamcast. Here, for Colin McRae Rally 2, the performance is poor across all three emulators. Now, I tested this on the PowerKitty X18S as well, a device with a much stronger processor, and I got pretty much the same performance. Similarly, playing this on the RG351P with a much weaker processor, I also ended up with the same performance as well. Okay, so we're going to leave it there in terms of the testing. There's still so much more to cover, including PSP, Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, Saturn, and GameCube. So make sure you subscribe to get all of that content. Now, overall, I really like the handheld. It's got a really nice screen and it's been very comfortable to use for the systems that I've tested it on so far. There's just one final thing to do, and that is to give details of the giveaway for the RG552. For your chance to win this grey Ambonic RG552 handheld, all you have to do is follow three simple steps. First, like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Secondly, join the Gym RPG Discord server, and this is so I can direct message the winner and organize shipping. To join, copy the invite link from the description, click the plus icon and paste the link and hit the join server button. Next, you need to hit the complete button at the bottom of the screen. Tick that you have read the rules and press the submit button. Now just one more step, click the verify channel, read the rules and click the green tick reaction icon to unlock the other channels. Thirdly, you'll find a competitions channel and here I want you to tell me what topics I should talk about in 2022 and write me a message less than 100 words. And that's it, you'll be entered into a random draw for the RG552. The competition closes 10th of January 2022, 11.59am Malaysian time. The winner will be revealed in the RG552 final thoughts and review video and I will sponsor $50 towards worldwide shipping, any remainder to be borne by the winner, otherwise the handheld will go to a backup winner. That's going to be it for this one, I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next one.